<laughs> All right. Well, my name is David Rush. I'm with AT&T, and uh, I flew out from uh, Atlanta yesterday to spend a little time with you and uh, had a fun time here in Sacramento. I know not everybody's from Sacramento, but, uh, but enjoyed being in your city last night. Um, how many of you are involved in, uh, in your part of the business specifically has involvement with the cloud? Can you raise your hand? Okay. How many of you consider yourselves cloud experts? Oh, we've got a little bit of a bravery up on the front row here. Well, I, I'm going to start off today by talking about, there's a couple seats up front if you want to come and kind of sneak in. Um, I, I'm going to start off today by showing you something that I found that, that I found to be really, uh, really fun. In fact, I'll, I'll warn you right now that this is the most fun slide I have all day. <laughs> so uh, I hope you, uh, hope you like it. Um, what people are saying about the cloud. We found this survey that was run by an official organization that just went out and <laughs> tested the general public. And 22% uh, of this sample group, which was over 1,000 people that they studied, um, actually had admitted, you know, these are the ones that admitted to it, right, that they had uh, fibbed when they said that they understood what the cloud was. So that was kind of part of the reason I had you raise your hand. And I saw some of you kind of going, you know, like this because the person next to you raised your hand too. So, uh, <laughs> so I understand that. But, you know, the survey asked some more questions that made this get even more interesting. Did you realize that 14% had pretended to understand the cloud on an interview? Oh wait, it gets better. This is my favorite bullet on the whole presentation. You ready? 17% have pretended to understand the cloud services on a date. <laughs> now, when you think about that, there, there are a lot of problems with this. Number one, what are you doing talking about cloud services on a date? And what kind of person do you think you're going to impress <laughs> by talking about cloud services on a date? To the point where you feel like you have to pretend you know more than you do. Well, hopefully when you leave today's session, you'll feel a little bit better about what goes on with the cloud, what the components are, kind of popular terms of it, and how to start thinking about how the cloud might apply to what you do in your daily jobs. So we'll start off talking about some technology trends that are reshaping not just government, but everyone that deals with IT services. We'll talk about some of the, uh, the network-enabled cloud, some of the architectures that we have stumbled into uh, by beginning to make use of cloud services. We'll look at cloud services themselves, and then we'll look at a couple of use cases for how they apply. Sound like a deal? Is that what you signed up for by coming? Okay, good. We'll get started with technology trends. There are, uh, are several things going on right now that uh, are really impacting the way we are thinking about what we need to do to serve our end customers. And those could be customers that are internal to our organizations or they could be uh, actual uh, end users that are you know, just basic citizens in a municipality or in the state that want to get access to your services. The first one is these incredibly powerful mobile devices that we all carry around. Um, they've really disrupted things. People can do more things outside of an office or away from their home than they ever could before. And so that's really causing significant changes. It wouldn't be causing as big of a significant of a change, is that the right way to say that? As significant of a change if they uh, weren't uh, also being swept up in the second wave here, which is the incredible availability of massive amounts of bandwidth. Now, we don't think about it as being massive, but if you take your mind back about you know, five, ten years ago, and you realize the kind of throughput you could get on a 4G device anywhere within the, the, uh, the area where that 4G service is available, you would be shocked at how much bandwidth. You'd be thinking, boy, if I could ever get there, you know, what, what more would I ever want? And now we're here and we all want more. But the idea is that it's very disruptive when people can conduct what used to be very restrictive activities from pretty much anywhere they want. And it's not just wireless. It, couldn't be, it could be mobility, but it could be uh, just as simple as having tremendous amounts of bandwidth available to the home, which allows people to do a lot more out of their uh, home environments than they used to ever be able to do before. The last one here is cloud computing. And in cloud computing, uh, we're here today to talk about that. And so obviously we believe that's disruptive. The, the way that's disruptive is in an equally um, a significant sense. What this is doing is causing us to have to rethink everything that we do as IT professionals around our job because cloud computing offers us the ability to offset a significant amount of our OPEX, almost all of our CAPEX expenditures, into an environment where we don't really even have to manage it, where we used to have to manage everything in the stack up to and including the application. Now we can kind of step back and, and manage as much of that as we really want to except for the stuff at the bottom, which the cloud does for you. Very disruptive, very important that we understand how this impacts what we're going to be doing. The reason I'm here today is because when you look at AT&T, AT&T is, you probably thought of us as being really big in the first two. Believe it or not, if we just pulled out the people inside of AT&T that do nothing but cloud services, we would be one of the largest employers of cloud professionals in the world. We have an extremely large cloud services organization. And so that's why I'm here to talk to you today. 
cloud is a business model. I want to talk a little bit about the way in which we use the cloud and why, you know, what the benefits are. Uh, this is kind of a classic understanding of, uh, of cloud services, so bear with me. We'll get into more detail in a minute. But when you look at what we get out of the cloud, um, you get an automatic standardization. No longer are you in a situation where when you go and deal with a vendor, you have to have them make all kind of gyrations and leaps to address what you need because you've set things up in your shop to be different. The cloud forces people to get to an environment where everything is much more uniform. Uh, depending on what uh, software package you buy into or what platform you're using, you're going to conform to a certain set of standards, whether it's the APIs that are available from that cloud service or you know, the, the basic capabilities of what that cloud service offers you. By standardizing, it means everybody begins to be able to take part in a commodity environment where things get much less expensive. And since everybody, a much larger group, is pushing for changes and improvements, what you end up with is a cloud service infrastructure that's better and better over time and more able to meet those custom needs that you used to have to do as an individual organization. So very, very important there. Um, dynamic on-demand on services. This is the big promise of the cloud, right? I don't have to do all of the uh, capacity management. I don't have to right-size everything from uh, the number of servers I've got to the number of VMs I've got in my virtualized environment to how much uh, storage capacity I have. I have an on-demand availability to turn up what I need to do business. And by the way, if I need to turn it back down, it's dynamic. I can turn it back down and stop paying for it all if I don't need all that capacity all the time. Very, very important there. And that obviously drives huge based economies because of the bottom item here, which is consumption-based pricing. So no longer do I have to pay for that infrastructure or invest a significant amount of my capital budget in putting in things that I think I've right-sized or I hope I've right-sized. I no longer have to worry about all that capacity management and planning part. All I have to do is make sure I'm using a cloud vendor that can access as much as I need. Uh, customer self-service. We know that in our environment, just as uh, in our, our regular course of doing business, we deal with people who are, um, we, we call these unreasonable demands for, you know, having self-service capabilities or quick changes uh, because they're used to doing it in their public lives now. You know, they pull out their iPhone or whatever their smartphone device is, they request something and boom, it's there. They can go into a cloud service as an uh, individual and back up their home laptop or desktop like that. They expect the same kind of thing when they're dealing with us. And, uh, and the cloud services environment can help enable that. Obviously, our world has been slower to get there than uh, the consumer market has demanded people go. And so the expectations on the part of the end users we deal with are much higher than oftentimes we're able to deal. And cloud enables that. Uh, APIs, I mentioned that a minute ago. This idea that there is a standard set of interfaces that you can build to, that if you do the build to the standard, then it doesn't matter which vendor you go to that's compliant with that set of APIs. You can plug your application or your workload into that particular environment and make use of that other vendor's service. So your services and your demand for these uh, cloud-based services can be much more of a commodity. You can begin to move and pick and choose with a vendor that you would choose. And you can change vendors if you would like, as long as everyone is compliant with the same set of APIs. Make sense? Okay. Um, this is more of the same. <laughs> Why is cloud so compelling? Uh, when you look at it, um, it, it basically takes the set of assets that a huge composite group of, uh, of users or customers uh, would want and puts it all in one big data center or a set of data centers that are geographically diverse and accessed by tremendous amounts of uh, bandwidth for connectivity and you operate in a shared pool. Depending on the vendor that you choose, you can use a uh, uh, kind of a uh, virtualized environment that's specific and dedicated to you or you may actually be able to negotiate for a specific set of servers or virtual servers that do nothing but serve your needs to meet whatever compliance standards or security standards that you might have from a policy perspective that you have to maintain. So you have the ability to create, in effect, a data center that is yours but is virtualized. It's somewhere else. So you don't have to deal with all the expenses associated with that data center. The improvements are pretty obvious. Tremendously uh, improved economics. Much lower complexity to manage it. and. Uh, your productivity goes up because the people that you've invested uh, training and hours in and have a limited number of things they can do during the day, those things that can be done automatically within the cloud service environment, they no longer have to do. You can move them to doing more uh, customer facing activities. So your internal customers that are demanding that you develop new capabilities, reach new 
uh, our audiences, um, improve some of the old environments, those people are now available to redeploy in those kind of efforts. All right, let's talk about kind of the overall architecture. Now this slide is kind of a, um, a throwback. You can see it says nice things like that are modern like cloud, but if I turn the clock back about 20 years, you'd see something that looked an awful lot like this. It'd have a lot less bandwidth and a lot less horsepower in the data center, but this is kind of what you would have. It's a dedicated private environment that uh, has different sites located uh, uh, remotely, you know, pick your geography away from the data center. And through a private network, they get access back to your data center, the one where most all the numbers are crunched, all the data storage is. What has happened in the modern environment is we've done a lot of things to get more efficient around our data and processing in the data center. So we've moved to a much more virtualized environment. We've put in VMs. We get much more efficiency out of our uh, server environment than we've ever got before. Uh, we're trying to data dedupe, so we save data wherever possible and eliminate the duplication that happens there. But by and large, the key here is that I have tremendous security here. I have a, um, a, a significant amount of ability to control what happens in this environment. So this is where we almost all come from and we're very comfortable here. The difference is, or the difficulty comes, when we look at what we've always had to do in this environment. Capacity management here is huge. You have to make sure that you have enough bandwidth to get into and out of all the different environments that you want to get to. You make sure that you have enough servers to be able to do the demand load for the workloads that are being asked for. And some of these may vary dramatically depending on what season you're in, uh, whether or not school has just let in or final exams are going, or if there's a disaster where you have a large amount of public need to get access to some of the information that your sites have. So the capacity management here is a, a big problem. And if you oversize it, then you have overspent and you're not being very efficient with your investment. So the problems here are kind of legion. This is a great but extremely expensive environment to be in. So let's look at the next alternative. This is what most people have done. Most people have said, I want to use cloud services. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take my existing environment and I want to just throw some uh, connectivity out to my cloud service provider. So I'm going to go to a public cloud environment where I can get access to all the things I keep hearing about and my boss keeps asking me about, and I'm going to architect it so it kind of hangs off of my previously private environment. Now, what does this do? It does some good things, right? It gives me access to that dynamically available processing capacity or storage capacity if that's what I need. So I have the ability to do some things I was not able to do before. So my capacity management from a CapEx expense perspective where I'm buying machines and putting them in my own environment, not so big. What problem have I created here from a performance perspective? Maybe this will help. It's the hairpin in and out of the data center, right? I still have to do capacity management on my bandwidth or fear having a choke point there that will cause my performance to suffer even if I have plenty of capacity already in arrangement or arranged for. So I've got some issues with this one as well. Plus, the security concerns about this are significant, right? Because my firewall now is not the extent of where I'm putting my data and my applications. So what I end up with is the ability for potentially people who have uh, motives that are not necessarily pure uh, to get a lot closer to my environment than I would really want them to. So what's the answer? There's a hybrid environment which takes uh, the existing environment that we talked about and uses a vendor that does the network for uh, your MPLS VPN kind of environment and has them attach their environment to your VPN. So if you choose a cloud provider that is also a network provider or who has a great relationship with a network provider, you can end up with an environment like this, which really is the best of all the worlds. I no longer have to capacity manage my servers. I don't have to capacity manage my data storage because I have those arranged for with infrastructure as a service in the cloud. I no longer have to worry about bandwidth constraints because theoretically at least, excuse me, uh, theoretically at least, the amount of capacity that the network provider is going to give me into the node that's in the cloud attaches to those services is going to be adequate for anything that I would need because it obviously would serve others. So you get the environment that you would have in a fully private w sense, but now you get it with access to a cloud. And where does the public attach to this cloud? On the other side of the cloud from your private VPN. Best of both worlds. It gets you higher performance. You can use class of service to make sure that internal contention doesn't wipe out access to certain applications that you really need. 
higher security and greater bandwidth efficiency. All right, that's the last networking diagram. No, you'll see one more, but that's it. Uh, let's talk about cloud a little bit. Um, this is a cloud, for those of you who didn't raise your hand when I asked if you knew what a cloud was. Um, there is a, a distinction made between the types of cloud services that you get within a cloud, and usually they're uh, taglined with an as a service. Anybody heard people talking about you know, something as a service? Uh, most of us are familiar with uh, software as a service, but let me talk through the definitional things here to help you see what's going on. The first is infrastructure as a service. This is access to uh, uh, storage, access to virtual machines and server environment so that you don't have to do that kind of capacity management yourself again. Um, the nice thing about this is that you have access to someone else's much larger capacity. The issues that go along with this and challenges that go along with this are the same as if you would had the stuff dropped to your loading dock. If you had a drop shipment made to your loading dock that was some new servers from Pick Your Vendor, um, you still have to bring it in, you have to wire it up, you have to network it and turn it up inside your environment where you can use it. Same thing here, the integration work associated with the acquisition of these service, uh, services needs to be done. So you still have that to take care of. It's not a huge deal, but it means that you still have to be involved in the nuts and bolts of actually connecting these services to your own environment. Above that, we've got platform as a service. There are two varieties of platform as a service. And uh, by the way, each of these build on each other. So a platform as a service environment, uh, if it's an infrastructure PaaS, uh, what it does is it takes those servers and storage and an operating system and some middleware generally and lumps them all together and does the integration for you. So now if you have a set of code that runs your applications, let's say you've got a Java application and you want to move that out of your data center into the cloud, you can take that fully formed Java app drop it into a platform as a service offer and usually those platform as a service offers have a full set of Eclipse plugins and whatever else you need to have those drop and go and you run that in the cloud even though the code is actually yours and the application is still yours to maintain. So it takes away all the issues associated with the uh, kind of management of the integration of an infrastructure as a service environment. At the upper end, or an APaaS, or application platform as a service, there will be a set of tools that are based off that integrated platform that let you actually develop uh, applications on your own. You can take data stores like spreadsheets or uh, databases, import them into a PaaS, and you can write input and output forms, uh, dashboards, things like that using some wizards that are already based in an APaaS that allow you to quickly generate uh, applications. I'll talk a little bit about, more about that in a few minutes because I think that's got some real benefits if you have anything to do with software development, whether you support them or you're a part of that organization. Last is software as a service. Software as a service is the one most of us are familiar with because a lot of us have seen these kind of packages and many of us have probably used these in our home life if you're using some, uh, something from one of the, uh, the large uh, box vendors like uh, Microsoft Office Suite. You may have seen Office 360. You may use uh, one of the Google App Suites where you go and get that. That's all cloud-based applications. These are great ways to take all the complexity and you just become a user, right? The complexity is pretty much gone. You approach the application and deal with it. And this is what most of the trade press would, uh, kind of the general groundswell of culture says this is where we're all going. Eventually you'll be getting everything from here. But there's a piece that people miss. Um, oftentimes when you deploy a variety of SaaS applications, you get because you pick it, the best in breed for that particular narrow piece of work that that uh, SaaS application supports. But now, what if you have multiple applications for the same user community? Now I have to train those people on the subtleties of every single application platform that they're going to. And what if they share common data stores? What if I'm dealing with a, uh, a particular, uh, so let's take something, something simple like a uh, uh, an inventory that has troubles. You know, somebody calls in and says there's an issue with a road at this particular spot. Um, I've got a database that has my road and my road characteristics, and I've got another one that has my planning that says when I'm scheduled to pave or send a repair crew out for maintenance schedules. Then I've got another one where people can call in and report or get online and report where the road problem is. That's probably three separate applications with three separate user interfaces and three sets of data that I have to synchronize between the two of them, otherwise, or three of them, otherwise they're not really aware of what's going on and I might give misinformation to either my road crews or to the person that's calling to complain that I've got an issue. So it's very important that you integrate across all of your data sets if you're doing SaaS apps. So there's integration at the bottom required, there's integration at the top required in a different sense but equally important 
the place where the integration actually is, the only place actually where it's all done for you is inside of a platform as a service environment where you can build all your applications in a single spot. By the way, I'll be writing a blog about this shortly, so you probably haven't heard this a lot before, but maybe that'll become part of the conversation after we start talking about it a little bit more. But it's one of those little known things that you may not be aware of. Also, if you're selecting a vendor for these type of applications, it's very useful to pick one that can provide all of them. Because the idea then is you can go through a common store a portal, if you will, and access these application capabilities on demand. Need more infrastructure? Same portal. Need more platform? Same portal. Need more users to go on a SaaS app? Same portal. Much simplifies your life. Makes it a much simpler environment for you to take advantage of. So when you select vendors, it's very important that you select someone who can provide the full suite of capabilities across all three areas. All right, that makes sense? Okay. Next slide, storage as a service. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because everybody knows storage as a service. It was the original cloud app, and so most of us know how that works. The only thing I'll say is that when you look at what the storage service is based on, make sure that it's based on uh, a higher grade service. You don't want to go with mom and pop storage services that are going down to the local box store and buying you know, Mac store Seagate drives for two terabytes for $139 coming in and plugging them all up and adding storage that way. That's not what we're all about in a cloud storage environment that has to have uh, a little bit more rigor behind it than that. So be careful who you choose because not everybody architects their storage environment the same way. Um, APIs, that's the way everybody's going to write to and take information out of those data stores that are put in these, uh, these cloud storage services. So when you look at the data stores, um, you might want to take a look and see what third-party vendors have already written to the APIs associated with those storage services. That means staying with the popular ones or staying with people who are compliant with kind of some of the standards that are emerging around data storage APIs. Make sense? That's it really for cloud storage services. I'll give you a use case. Um, when you look at it in the generic sense, part of the problem of managing a life cycle of data is the demands of that data set. We know that at the outset we need uh, probably to have direct attached storage so we can get access to it as our applications really need it. Because when data is new and fresh, that's when people are hitting it the most and changing it the most, right? Over time, we, uh, we see the demand set kind of dry up as we go to the long tail side. And so we start thinking, I'm getting massive amounts of data volumes that are building up with a lot of data that people aren't using anymore. And so I start to look at archiving that or moving it off of my environment. The problem is kind of this desert land in between, which says I've got an awful lot of data that I don't know what to do with. I don't really have a constant steady demand for it, so I don't necessarily need to have it in my direct attached storage environment where things are much more expensive. At the same time, I'm not ready to archive it and spin it off. So how do I fill the gap in the middle? Cloud service storage is a great way to do that. It bridges the gap between the two. So you can begin to take the data that is not hot and fresh for your apps that run in your data center, and you begin to push that out into a virtual environment as you are seeing less and less demand for it. And over time, if you want to take it to an archive that actually gets it off the cloud altogether, you can do that, although cloud storage is getting cheaper uh, by the day. So there's a lot of options where you actually probably don't have to take it out of the cloud at all. But a lot of us still there, believe it or not, there are a lot of people that still run tape storage and send it off to you know, an iron, a mountain somewhere with a hole to put it in. Uh, that's still perfectly valid if that suits your business needs and your requirements to meet policy. But you don't have to do that anymore if you don't want to. All right. Park district applications example. Yes. And by the way, if I've done some sort of a shared processing environment with a cluster um, or some sort of distributed workload that, uh, you know, being managed by a system, then oftentimes my end users don't actually see any downtime. You know, it's really great. Um, if you've got a high requirement for that, terrific. But the cost of this environment is as high as you get because you've got an awful lot of idle capacity, an awful lot of idle um, investment that sits there unused until you actually need it. So. Obviously, what's the answer? Uh, a cloud-based environment for most situations for DR can really resolve this nicely. Going from a sunny day to a rainy day means I now turn into the cloud data center that I've set up. Oh, sorry. I uh, fire up the virtual machines who have, in the meantime, been dormant. All I've paid for is the amount of storage I needed to have there to run the application set when I move my workload over, and I'm good to go. My rainy day is no longer rainy. It wasn't fun but I recovered it. It didn't cost me an arm and a leg all year long whether I used it or not. All right. Um, 
this is a really interesting use case, and so I'll, I'll spend a little time on this. There was a utility company in the Northeast that had a problem with, you remember Hurricane Irene? It may not have been as big a deal here as it was out on the East Coast, but it caused a lot of trouble up and down the Eastern seaboard, starting with Florida and working its way up all the way to New England, where it really caused some trouble. Um, there was a utility company there that had uh, two applications in particular I'll talk about. One was the, uh, the work management function, the ticketing management and dispatch function for their service technicians. So during the time of a disaster, utility crews, local and sometimes are called in from outside of state to come and help with those problems, uh, kind of converge on this area and they get access to this ticketing system that tells them where they're supposed to go repair something next. And they have a priority queue that prioritizes larger groups that are impacted versus somebody whose house, you know, line fell down. Um, at the same time, the second application, that would be fine by itself, right? But they had a second application that was using the same data center and coming in over the same, same uh, data circuits that was their public information service. So the public could come in and call in a trouble, hey, I don't have power, or um, hey, can you give me status on that call I made five minutes ago when I said I didn't have power? Uh, or can you show me the neighborhood map that shows me what's affected? Now, great applications, both of them, very important in the event something like this happens and very relevant not just for a utility company but for anybody who serves that kind of a, you know, of a audience uh, in the time of disaster. Well, you can imagine what that did to the bandwidth coming into and out of the data center where they were running both of these applications. It choked them down and no longer could the field technicians get access to the, uh, their ticketing and dispatch application, but the public couldn't get any page refreshes done and couldn't find their, you know, the status. So the phone lines went off the hook and nobody could get, it was an ugly, ugly situation. On the second day of this happening, uh, they reached out to some of our folks and we turned up an instance of cloud computing, computers as a service with some storage for them and took the customer application offline into the cloud, took it completely out of that data center and moved that workload into the cloud. That was done with some legion effort over the course of about 16 hours. So pretty fast, but clearly under duress. Um, what you wound up with was a situation where all of a sudden availability for the public went through the roof. Constraints on who could get access to the dispatch information, gone. All with one change that was accomplished in a matter of under a day under duress, but was done in under a day, that solved the contingent problem of a real life, real world situation that can happen to any of us that have public facing uh, requirements. Now, the solution, am I going here still? Here we go. Um, obviously much less expensive, but let's face it, the real issue at that point was not expenses, right? There was a PR fallout that was huge that was averted from that, and we all know what that drives. Uh, but more importantly, the customers and the citizens were being served in a way that they were no, not previously able to be served by adding cloud services to that particular environment. Here's, an Here's what we saw, by the way, when we turned it up for them. Um, you can see the, uh, the event date was in late August, but we turned it up about maybe four in the afternoon on the 29th, and you can see there was a little activity still going on in that afternoon from people who were just persistent enough to keep trying. Um, and then you have nighttime, and then you see the next day. Look at the kind of volumes that were causing things to choke down at the bandwidth point to the data center, the access to the data center. Doing the math, that's nine megabits per second of traffic at peak. Nobody is gonna size that in their capacity planning. You cannot size that way practically uh, and, and accomplish any kind of uh, economy uh, for uh, due diligence to the CFO who's somewhere, you know, churning numbers for you. But you can see how by freeing up the uh, access to those two uh, demand sets, very different, very important, tremendous volumes were, be able to, were able to be handled, whereas before those were being throttled at about, I think it was like 25% of those peaks. Okay. Let's talk about platform as a service, since I kind of made a big deal about that when we were talking about services, right? I do that because a lot of people really haven't heard or haven't spent much time looking at it. Um, this is a customer example. Uh, this is a classic case of where uh, email, spreadsheets, great business tools. I mean, they're great ways to do business. They're terrible ways to do process. But we all use them, 
We all use them to communicate what's going on, what status is, what needs are. We all use them to track data and share that around. We sometimes try to post them in a way that they're shared so people can get in and make changes to a spreadsheet. I mean, and, and by the way, this happens inside government, it happens inside small business, it happens inside AT&T. Everybody has this issue. Um, there's a way to do this better. We had a customer that had this situation going on between a lot of different vendors that they were using. And what they did was, um, actually, I show this as kind of mail. They were using faxes to do invoices and dispatch kind of functions. Here's a job for you to go perform. It was in the healthcare industry. Um, and uh, what happened was is that you would have big delays in terms of knowing whether or not the vendor actually picked up the work order and was actually going to do it. And then when the work order was noted as completed and the, and the fax came back, when did you pay? You know, did you pay them? Okay, somebody had to take the fax, log it in manually, get that all done. Now that's an extreme example. Um, but what happened is, is that by replacing this with an automated environment through AT&T Platform as a Service in this particular example, we were able to create an application that allowed the people who were submitting the work orders to the vendors to get that out there in a hurry. The people, once they went in and looked at it, there was an automated notification via email or text that says, okay, vendor X has got it. Then the vendor could update status, work in progress, work completed. When work was marked completed, the uh, program then sent a notice to billing to say, okay, bill. And that triggered an invoice that paid the vendor. The vendor cycle for payment was reduced from sometimes months down to days much happier vendors, much happier company who is getting their revenue much more quickly. Another way this helps a lot is that oftentimes these kind of requests that go back and forth in email include an attachment. Somebody's filled a form out, you know, a word form or something like that. They've attached it to the file, they've sent it to somebody. Here's my request. Um, <laughs> what happens is, is that the person who gets the request uh, takes that attachment, looks at it and goes, okay, uh, I think I can do this and they work some stuff, authorize it, or they send it off to, you know, their manager who then has to approve it and send it back. And by the way, that person makes a copy on their desktop. Um, and then they send it back to the person who's actually the interface with that requesting entity who takes a look and st stores that email from their boss saying, yes, this is approved. Then it sends back to the person who requested it, right? So how many copies of those files do I have right now? It's tremendous. And how do I audit the trail for the approval so I can go back and see what was done? horrible situation if you're in that kind of a compliance environment especially. So what happens with a platform as a service environment is that you're able to put an application in the place of these great tools that aren't really good process tools. So put an application in place to manage this process. And the nice thing about that is that this application can be built by someone who doesn't know code. I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, when you look at any of these type of sets, software as a service or platform as a service. It's really not about the application, it's all about the data. It's all about the data. Somebody needs to collect it, somebody needs to gather it, somebody needs to track what changes happen to it, and somebody needs to get it where it needs to go. If you're working in a common environment, you can use a common data store so that synchronizing the different instances of that data becomes a non-issue because it's all pulling off the same database, the da same data set. So when you go to a PaaS provider, make sure that they are using a strong, reliable relational database environment online in the cloud so that you have a robust environment where you can consolidate all this data in a single place that doesn't have the, uh, the issues associated with uh, consolidating in an unreliable environment or keeping different data stores that have to then be synchronized. Okay. Here's what PaaS is good for. Rapidly developing situational apps. Something comes up, got to have this developed. I've got a need that has to be met in a very short time frame. A PaaS platform can do that for you. An application-based PaaS can rapidly assemble surveys, feedback forms, things that were, you know, events where someone spoke and they want to put out a URL that allowed the public to go and reply with their feedback. Those can be rolled out very rapidly. It also can do uh, enable business unit developers. People who have been waiting on the software development queue to come around to them forever and have never been able to get their application out. Very disgruntled. Low, your so customer satisfaction scores, if you're responsible for that, are very low with those folks. Um, enabling people who understand the processes that are being worked and the demands of those processes, giving them a set of tools and wizards that allow them to create the application themselves can take those folks completely out of the development queue 
freeing your developers to work on the more high-flying needs that they need to take care of, but helping people who need to develop things themselves, even if they don't know code, as long as they know the process, they can do it, to develop those tools as they need. Um, the last is to consolidate and modernize applications. Everybody deals with this. You've got legacy platforms that have been uh, retired. Uh, you, know, you can continue to renew the licenses every year, but you really wish you didn't have to. Um, but you've got applications you can't turn off because certain user communities need them there. You have other applications that you just don't want to touch, but they are so long in the tooth you're kind of embarrassed to have your end users go touch them. You can take those and put a veneer over them using a platform as a service environment. Writing two APIs, or if there's, you know, so old it doesn't have APIs, you can actually create the equivalent of that for those apps. Um, and m put a kind of a, a facade on the front of them. So now they look like brand new apps. And by the way, they look like the suite of apps that are also hosted on that platform as a service environment. So you've modernized the entire thing. And if you use a PaaS that is based around an internet access, so, for example, at and you access that through a browser. Now, I have automatically mobilized that environment because anyone with a smartphone that has a decent mobile browser can get full access to that application platform when they're not in their office from anywhere. I won't say on vacation because I know you've all had that fun experience, but pretty much anywhere you need to be uh, at lunch with your spouse or significant other, uh, something comes up, you can get into the system and do what needs to be done from a remote location. Even on those old applications that you don't want to touch and are written in older code that nobody really even knows how to maintain anymore. So a big benefit to you. And by the way, if you want to see examples of this, um, there are some videos that are out on YouTube that I help produce, so you'll see my face in them. Uh, but you can go to uh, YouTube and search for AT&T PaaS, P-A-A-S and uh, it'll tell you how to kind of build things and show you how, it, how all that kind of import stuff works, just to get a feel for how a pass works. All right, so here's what we talked about today. Uh, virtual cloud model, the private cloud model, is the best way to keep your performance and your econ performance up, economics down. If possible, if at all possible, choose a cloud services provider that can do the broadest scope in cloud and networking. I'm not at all biased when I say that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the idea is that one-stop shopping is tremendously valuable in a virtualized environment where people are used to going to one spot to get everything. The big payoff for the infrastructure as a service offerings is you get it when you need it and you pay as you go. It saves you all the capex and a significant amount of the opex expense associated with it. And last is a PaaS environment can quickly build, uh, update, and mobilize your application set without, in many instances, even you know, uh, touching or changing the application environment that's running today. This will help your efficiency of your software development crews tremendously, and it'll make the customer satisfaction with software development, which, let's face it, is typically not the highest customer set group inside of our organizations, can help improve that dramatically because their responsiveness can be so greatly improved. That's all I've got. We've got a little time for questions, so uh, what can I answer for you? Yeah. That someone has to have the capacity somewhere, right? So in your case, at and yes. I, I don't know the customer that the capacity that I'm going to need in the future is going to be available and, not, and someone else taking it out. That's a great question, and there's two answers for that. Um, oh, see, I'll repeat the question. Thank you, thank you. The question is, um, if I go to a cloud service provider, and I know I'm going to need more capacity than I'll have kind of on a run rate basis. I'm changing your words a little bit. Um, how do I know that there'll be enough for me to use when I need it, when I know other customers are going to be needing more than they're telling you to? Fair capture? Okay. Uh, and I said there's two answers for this. The first is that um, you want to make sure that whoever you're investing that architecture with has a track record of being able to manage their capacity. Because remember, when you stop managing the capacity demand and go to a dynamically available service like this, um, you're kind of outsourcing the management of that capacity planning function. So make sure you pick somebody who can do that and has a proven record of managing capacity to be adequate to the needs. Most of the um, top tier providers in cloud services should have a track record that's easy to see around how reliably they're managing their capacity. Uh, the second piece is, is that you have to stay close to your cloud services provider. You need to have the relationship with those teams so that you can look at those folks, pick them up 
a call and say, look, there's a problem, or I've changed my demand set, and I'm going to be pushing X amount towards you, because nobody has an infinite cloud. We're all running the data centers behind the scenes that make the cloud services look infinite to you and everybody else who needs them. They are not infinite. So the more advanced warning you can let us know about, the better we're able to make sure that you never run out. In a situation where you have a true disaster and everybody's going to be hammering these things hard, um, there's a potential to have contention. Um, we have had some pretty large disasters happen and we've never run into that personally speaking, but that doesn't mean that that's going to be the case in every situation. Uh, the response I tell you there is that if you're using subscription-based services today for disaster recovery in particular, for that large-scale environment, um, contention's built into those. Those are first-come, first-served environments anyway, and I will say that you're uh, almost guaranteed to be better off in a cloud service environment which is designed to be dynamic and meet a huge amount of needs and can be rapidly turned up for everybody within that type of unified infrastructure than you would be going to a um, typical disaster recovery environment where you're doing a subscription in order to get access to what you know is a limited set of services for a smaller group of customers, all of whom are going to be competing for that. So does that make sense? I gave you three answers when I said I was going to give you two. But yeah, but that brings up another question. Is that it? Sure. There's a, uh, there's a system of voice services that, that uh, in the case of an emergency or whatever, then uh, uh, certain uh, public safety agencies have priority over, over those services. Yes. Is, is, does it exist for a unified environment as well? There is no equivalent for that type of prioritization. The way that you gain the equivalent of that, or at least an approximation of that, is by attaching it to your virtual private network so that the network contention piece of that is done away with. So all you're dealing with is co competition for that specific set of resources. And as long as the network connectivity designed into the cloud is adequate, then you should be way ahead of the game for everyone else. <coughs> so you're saying reserve certain... <coughs> uh, like the picture that showed the virtual hybrid design, uh, make sure that your cloud is attached to your virtual private network. And that you've attached, uh, you've discussed it with your vendor that you're attaching at multiple points so that a single ge geographic failure won't take you out. Uh, let's talk more about this oh, offline. Okay. Any other questions? Last chance. I got a minute warning just a second ago. All right. Thank you very much for coming today. I appreciate you letting me have a chance to talk to you. Enjoy the rest of the conference. <laughs>